We're so excited that you're here today. Thank you for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. Today, we're going to be continuing on in our Revival Ready series, and we're going to be talking about digging spiritual wells. Um, I don't know about you, but digging is not one of my favorite things. I thought about bringing in the shovel that we have out there on the farm, and any time I have to pick that thing up, my back starts to feel it before I even start to pick it up, and I'm like, oh no, I do not want to go out there and start digging. It's one of the hardest things that you do. You know, as I was researching in Scripture, one of the things that I, I, a quote that I saw is, you know, everything below ground, like it, there's valuable stuff that you could find below ground. You could find gold, you could find silver, you could find things like that. The diamonds are found underground, right? And it said everything above ground is wood, hay, and straw that could be burnt up, right? So although we might not always like digging, digging can be a very good thing, especially in the context of what we're talking about today of living water. And I am so glad that Pastor Adam asked me to speak on this particular topic. The first church that Mary Jo and I actually planted was called Living Waters Community Church. It was something that was near and dear to our heart, this particular subject. So if you entered this place today and you're feeling dry, if you're feeling spiritually parched, if you're emotionally lacking, if you're physically lacking, you came to the right place today because I've got some good news for you in Jesus' name. Now, some of you look pretty spiritually fired up before service, so that's a great thing too, and we are really excited. If you're spiritually fired up, you came to the right place today too, because I'm going to remind you of the importance of giving it away to keep it. You got to give it away, because if you let your streams run dry, you will get parched, but if you don't give away this spiritual living water that God puts in our hearts, it gets stagnant, right? We don't want that to happen. So we've got something for everybody here in this place today. Lord, we're here to talk about digging deep to get the living water of the Holy Spirit. And I ask you, Father, to show up in this place today, work through these stories to draw us closer to a relationship with you. May some even find you for the very first time in this place today. For those who are spiritually parched, would today be a day that you revive their souls? Would you touch them and draw them into a deeper relationship with you this morning? For those who are fired up, would they remember the importance of sharing the good news of the gospel with all they encounter? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So I want to start with a little bit of a story. Um, Mary Jo and I just went on vacation And uh, we had a really good time. We were up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we happened upon this place called Lookout Mountain. It was a beautiful place. When you go to the top of the mountain, they have this place called Rock City that you can kind of oversee five or six different states, maybe even seven from that particular location. It's absolutely stunning and beautiful. And one of the tourist attractions there is called Ruby Falls. And I was like, man, okay, we got to go check this place out. So we go there and they start to tell us the story of this man. His name was Leo Lambert. And in 1933, he found something absolutely incredible at this place. So as the story goes, there was this cave that was visible that was becoming a little bit of a tourist attraction. And people would go there and they would go check out the stalactites and the stalagmites and all the other mites that might be hanging out in those caves, right? Um, The cave ended up having to be covered up because the railway railway was coming by. So um, he felt as a geologist, man, people have to see this cave that's there. I've got to let them get in there and check it out. He also had a financial incentive and he had some backers that were with him and he convinced them to give him money and his idea, which sounds crazy on the surface was that he's going to go to the top of the mountain and he's going to dig down and he's going to find that tunnel that they ended up covering up and he's going to turn it into a tourist attraction. Now digging in that mountain wasn't the easiest thing to do. It actually had a lot of stone that was in there, right? So I asked the guy, like, how, how far did these guys actually dig on a daily basis? And he said, maybe five feet. 
It was over 1,200 feet deep as it ends up being, maybe five feet a day. So they ended up using dynamite to blast away the rocks. They ended up doing tools to blast away the rocks, whatever they could do. But they're making small progress each and every day, just little bit by little bit. They're starting to go down, and they're starting to make this shaft down to the cave that they know that they exist, right? But then all of a sudden, they come across this little crevice that's about just enough to crawl through, and he sticks his head in there, Leo, and he's like, there's like a breeze coming out of this thing. It's not supposed to be that way with a cave that's in the center or, you know, of a mountain, right? There's a crack there. What's a breeze coming out? That means there maybe is an opening on the other end. And this guy's just crazy enough to go in there and start to crawl. And he's going to start to check it out. So he's, imagine that in those days. He's probably hanging by a rope, going down this thing. He knows that down there somewhere, there's this tunnel that he's trying to hit, but he's not there yet. And he sees this little thing. I'm, I'm going to go explore. I get in there about five feet. I'm like, I'm turning around. <laughs> I'm not staying in there. They said that this dude crawled on his hands and knees in a shaft that was about this big for six or seven hours, just crawling and crawling. Man, I'd be freaked out, man. Like, how do you get back? You can't turn around, right? Then all of a sudden it opens up. He gets in there and there's a place about seven hours in where he could stand. It's like, wow. He sees some water kind of trickling down by the sides. He was maybe halfway to what he was going to end up seeing at that particular place. I don't know exactly how many more hours it ended up taking him. He didn't know where he's going, but all he knows is that there's this fresh breeze. How's there this breeze in the center of a mountain? How crazy is this? So he continues to dig. He continues to go down. He continues to flow. And then all of a sudden, the cave opens up into this monumental thing that I'm going to show you in just a second. This monumental thing. He had no idea of the treasure that he was about to uncover. Go ahead and run the video if you've got it up there. He stumbles across that. They even had the LEDs back then. I mean, it was awesome. He stumbles across that in the middle of a mountain. They still don't know where the water comes from. They've never found the source of it. There's no open source. They could tell where it goes, but they can't tell where it came from. And when you start to draw spiritual analogies for a moment, sometimes you got to dig and you got to dig and you got to dig and God has a miracle waiting around the corner. You know how awe-inspiring this was? We knew what we were about to see. We actually watched the video before we went there and we're standing around the corner and the guide stops us and we're like, will you let us go see it already, man? Come on. And then we rounded that corner and it was like, Wow, God, you are good. You are amazing. When your word talks about living water, that's what I'm talking about in Jesus' name. I mean, that is awesome. It gave us a feeling that we had only had a couple times in our life. I remember this time that Mary Jo and I had the pleasure of being in Rome. It was one of our anniversaries, like a big milestone anniversary. And we were there and we're walking through that city. And we had one of the sites we wanted to see was this place called the Trevi Fountain, right? It's supposed to be pretty cool. Um, you know, we, we all of a sudden, you're walking in this city. There's this ancient stuff. There's this new stuff. We round the corner and bam, the Trevi Fountain is there. I think they got a picture of that as well. Look, but... Pictures don't do these things justice. You walk around the corner and you see something like that. It's like, oh, wow. Just one more for you. We were once again on vacation and we're driving on this place in Colorado called Independence Pass. It's the highest road that's drivable in the United States. Probably two plus miles up when you get up there. And there's a rare feature in geology where there's actually some, very few lakes that are at the top of mountains. Very few in all of the world, you, you, you'll barely find it. So we get up there and we didn't even know about this place, but we see all these crazy people like going up the side of a mountain. They'd all stop, like we're way up there. You're like, what are these people doing? So of course we gotta pull over and see what all these crazy people are doing, right? So we get off and they say, hey, what's going on? They're like, there's a lake up there. We're like, okay, we gotta go check this out. So. We're from Florida, remember? So sea level, remember? <laughs> so we start going up there. I swear we get like, you know, <laughs> we walk for like five minutes and then you're like wiped up, man, I gotta stop. 
Then you walk for like two minutes, you're like, man, I got to stop. Then you like walk for one minute, you're like, man, I got to stop. I swear I probably got what I, I was hoping we were like almost there, right? And we're up there probably three quarters of the way. I'm, I'm turning around, man. I can't get up there. This is, this is not going to be good, right? But we pressed on and we took a few more steps and a few more steps. And we got up there and there was the most glorious, beautiful lake. And you could see for miles and miles and miles from that mountaintop, what would have happened if we would have stopped short? What would have happened if we would have stopped digging, right? And we'll talk about our spiritual tools for digging in just a moment, but think about how awe-inspiring water just is, right? I've never met a kid in my life that doesn't like to try to jump in the water and swim, have you? I mean, little kids just go for it. How many of you have stood at the edge of the ocean? We live in Florida, right? We get to go out there. Other people don't have the luxury of beaches. And man, they come here and they are rushing to the beach. We take it for granted maybe sometimes. But you go out there and it's just awe-inspiring to stand at the edge of the beach and see the glory of God's creation and majesty crashing up onto the shores, right? Water does something in our lives, It's amazing, and God says that in his word, he wants to give us living water. If water in the natural is that glorious, what might this living water be like? Revelation 22, 1. As I looked at that waterfall, I couldn't help but think of what it might feel like when I get to heaven. God gives us a description. It says, then the angel showed me a river of the water of life bright as crystal flowing from the throne room of God and from the Lamb. And in the middle of the street of the city and also on either side of the river was the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding fruit each month. The leaven of the tree were for the heal, or the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There's a river flowing from the very throne room of God that wants to reach you. And if you are parched and dry today, God wants to revive you. He wants to reinvigorate your soul. He wants to do something very special in you today. Water water is critical to life. Our bodies are made up of over 60% water, right? Do you know for those of you who are fasting and, you know, you're going through it, some of you have been really doing it really diligently and you've maybe even fasted for seven days or 14 days at this particular stage, but guess what? You could go without food for some time, but if you go without water for even a couple days, you ain't going to be living very long, right? And guess what? One of the things that ends up happening is if you get slightly dehydrated in the natural, then all of a sudden it begins to affect your thinking. It begins to affect your motor skills. So how many Christians, though, are walking around spiritually dehydrated and don't even know it, right? We need to be revived. We need God's word to touch us today. He's longing for us to come to him thirsty He says, give even a cold drink in my name and you will be rewarded. God wants to bring some cold drinks to some people in here today. In scripture, this water symbolizes the Holy Spirit and the gift of eternal life that God offers to those who believe in him. In the Old Testament, living water is first introduced in the book of Isaiah, where the prophet speaks of a fountain that will be opened to cleanse the people from their sins. So water in the natural has this solvent effect. If you're cooking and you actually get some stuff stuck to the bottom of the pan, what do you end up doing? You usually soak it for a little while, right? And then you come back and then all of a sudden it's a lot easier to remove. See, if you start to get a little bit stinky, the solution to that is to go take a shower in Jesus' name, right? And what this is saying is that when sin is clinging on us, there's this water of the Holy Spirit that is meant to cleanse us and clean us and renew us and refresh us. In the New Testament, Jesus often uses the imagery of living water to refer to the gift of the Holy Spirit. He promises that he will give this gift to believers as part of eternal life and to quench their spiritual thirst. May we not walk around in a spiritual state of dehydration. 
Psalms 42, one says, as a deer panteth for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Would we have a hunger and a thirst for the King of kings and Lord of lords to be in his presence, to spend time with him, to long to be around him? I I know that's the kind of church we are here, Journey Church. I see you. I see you here on Wednesday nights. I see you here praying at nine in the morning. You want to draw close to God. You know the importance of the things that I'm talking about here today. Last week, Pastor Adam talked about prayer and how God's word are linked, right? Right? When activated, they bring revival. When we pray, when we dig into God's word, then guess what? Revival begins to happen in our life. So as you start to think about the tools, we don't use picks and shovels. We use prayer and the word to dig spiritual holes that lead us to these places where living water is at. And when we find them, if you open up the very first Psalm, one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands by the way of sinners, nor sits at the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word, right? And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and all he does, he prospers. Man, if you want to prosper, if you don't want to be spiritually dry, you better get up near the river, right? It says there's an easy solution to this. It says spend time with God. Spend time in his word. Get to know him. You will be refreshed. You'll be revived. If you're going out there, it's a, what was that song that was back in the 80s for those of us who are older? Don't go chasing waterfalls, right? Stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to, right? That song was about cheating, by the way, right? Don't be cheating on God trying to find other waterfalls and other rivers and trying to find your sustenance in different places, See, if you'll go find them in him, you will be satisfied, you will not wither, you will thrive, you will bear good fruit. So if you don't find yourself at that place today, the question to start to ask yourself is, are you doing the digging that you need to be doing and the fertilizing that you need to be doing so that you could bear good fruit? Things will try to steal your time and keep you from your relationship with him. As believers, we know the answers. Lord Jesus, would you help us? The reality is that at times it feels like we're trying to dig a thousand feet and making only five feet of progress per day. You ever been there? You ever had those difficult days? Those days where it's two steps forward, one step back? That's part of the reality of the sinful life that we find ourselves in, right? But guess what? There might be that beautiful waterfall on the other side of it. Would you keep digging? Keep digging. Don't let the storms of life deter you. Remember that story in the Bible where the storms were all around? Remember that you serve the God who calms the storms. I know life can be difficult at times. That same ocean that looks so beautiful when you go out there some days can relentlessly pound you day after day after day at other seasons in life, can it not? I remember being out there in the ocean. I don't remember if it was here or Miami, but there's some days you just don't want to be up in there because you can't even sit still. You can't relax because one wave is coming after another and it doesn't relent. And that's how the devil will try to do you. He's going to try to make one wave crash upon you and another wave crash upon you to get you off balance, to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. You need to rebuke him and say, get thee behind me, Satan. I serve the God of the universe who calms the seas And I'm keeping my eyes fixed on him and him alone. If things are hard right now, imagine yourself as Leo Lambert crawling on his hands and his knees, not knowing necessarily where he was going, but God took care of him and he found some living water that was in there. But imagine God pouring that waterfall over your life. So let's get practical for just a couple moments. How do we dig spiritual wells that lead to a Psalms 1 kind of life? I believe the answer is found for us in Matthew chapter 6. Six times in that one chapter, he refers to the secret place, the secret place, the secret place. Matthew 6, 3. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing 
so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. But you Christians talk about giving way too much. What's wrong with you? This ain't a sermon about money. This is a sermon about digging deep spiritually. But God knows something about our hearts. One of the biggest competitors always is money, is it not? Money always tries to captivate us. Money always tries to lead us astray. It always tries to keep us going into different places rather than going to God. So he starts off this chapter on spiritual growth and godly living and discipleship and the very few verses off the jump talk about giving. If you can't get the giving right, I think part of what God might be saying is that you're probably not going to get the other stuff right. But guess what? If you got the giving right and you're still nasty in other areas, that's an issue too, right? You got to deal with that, right? But he starts off with that. So we got to deal with the reality of that. We take so much for granted, or I do. I don't want to speak for you. I think about water again in the natural. I grew up in Florida. My whole entire life, I was able to walk up to the little pipe and turn it on. And every single time I have turned that on, it has come on, bar a couple of times living out here when we had freezes, right? But every time, faithfully, I've gone to that faucet and turned it on and it's come on, right? In Florida, you dig just a couple of feet and all of a sudden water's popping up, you know, but for much of the world, it's not that way, right? I keep one picture on my phone. I've told you before, I have these reminders because I'm dumb sometimes and I need to remind myself of certain things. And one of the pictures that I have on my phone is of a little kid in Africa that's bending down on his knees and drinking water from a polluted puddle. And I put that as a reminder for me, lest I forget and say, Lord, I know that I know that I want to go put wells in every school over there in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, so that no kid has to live like that. I don't know where the money for such a thing is going to come from, being honest with you. I know that we've done one so far, and I've got about 100 more to go. But God's going to deliver on that, right? That's why when I try to tie these concepts, my money's not my own, right? I've got to give it away. And somehow God gives it back when we give it away. How crazy is that? In fact, he gives us more so that we can continue to be more generous. But when we hold on to it and we don't give it away, then guess what? You end up with less somehow. I don't know why God's word works in that way. But man, I want to encourage you, if this is an area that you do not have down yet, man, go give it away. Do what God's word says in this area. If you're afraid to give to the church because they ask for money, I'll tell you how you could give to do wells in Africa. Or I'll tell you how you can connect with Patrick and the people over at Mercy so that they could go make a difference. We need to break that down so that we can continue to move on. Matthew 6, 6, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray for your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So if you're spiritually dry, we're just really repeating the first two weeks, pray and then fast and then give and then seek his face through the word, right? So are you regularly praying? Are you, do you have that secret place? Do you have a place in your house where you could get away for a few moments or that place that you walk down the street and, and go spend some time with God? If you're not regularly praying and you're a Christian, I guarantee you you're spiritually dehydrated. There's no way you could face the worries of this world without praying, right? Without seeking his face, without reading his word. If you're not doing these things, I don't say this to guilt you. I'm offering you a solution. Just put it into practice, right? I guarantee you, Patrick did a 90-day thing that he talked about. This is one. If you do these things and it don't work, I will gladly refund your misery 90 days from now. I will gladly do it. In Matthew 6, 17, this one's a lost art in modern-day Christianity. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that while your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Are you fasting? It says, this, this to me is the lifestyle of the believer, and I'm just as guilty as everybody else on many of these, right? I'm a work in progress. I'm trying to grow in these areas. But man, we're in a corporate fasting season. Are you participating with the church? Or are you partying during the middle of it, right? Myself included, right? 
Are you trying to go a little bit deeper? That may be for some, hey, I've never skipped a meal before. I'm going to skip a meal. For others, that might mean, hey, I'm going to skip two meals and just eat at night. For yet others, that might mean you're going to go on a multi-day fast. Whatever that means for you, every one of you is different. I'm not here to guilt anybody. I'm just telling you, try to do something a little bit different, especially if you're spiritually parched. We're in a season where people are being revived. There's stories all around us of miracles are happening. And if that's not happening in your life, we're telling you how you could get this. It's not a secret, although God wants you to go to the secret place. It's not a secret how you could be revived, right? Would we just walk in his ways? God, you are good. It says Psalm 63:10. God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek after you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Again, I talked about taking it for granted, maybe living here in the United States or living in Florida. You know, when, when we were over there in Zimbabwe, they have a rainy season, right? It's a short season each year where if the rain don't come, they're going to be starving later in the year. It is literally life or death. And then we get to the tragedy of the thing. Guess what? There's water underground for most of them. The water's there, but they can't dig deep enough to get it. We have it at our disposal. Spiritual water especially don't take a whole lot of digging. God says, if you will seek me, you will find me. He guarantees you that. He will show up. You've got to put in a little bit of work, right? But for them, life or death is right there under the ground and they can't reach it. But for us as believers, we have that opportunity to dig deep and find him every single time. I've got one last story for you to start to wrap it up. Genesis 33 is the story of Jacob's well. It's a marker of the place where Jacob encountered God. It was a source of life in the desert for many years. They were able to dig deep enough to find a watering place that would provide water for generation after generation after generation. Jesus comes on the scene many years after Jacob's well is done. And remember, where Jacob planted that well was a place of encounter with God. He encountered God in that place. And in Jesus' time, the area was known as Samaria. The Samaritans were Jewish people who were considered heretics. They had a varied form of religion that was not pure Judaism, and they had intermarried with the Assyrians, and the purer Jewish people, so to speak, hated going through that city. They didn't want anything to do with the Samaritans, so the very place where Jacob, the father of all them, encountered God is now this place where people didn't want to go. And it's in this place that Jesus intentionally goes out of his way to go there. Remember those of you who I talked about are fired up that want to stay fired up, right? You want to stay on fire for God? You got to give it away. You got to go out of your way to go see other people who are dry and parched. And that's not always fun, is it? When somebody's struggling and you're doing what you want to do and you're chilling and you're watching the Jaguars and somebody calls and then all of a sudden they need help, you don't want to give up what you're doing to go help them per se, right? But miracles happen when you go out of your way. Believers, that journey, there's an imperative in our life. If you are full of the Holy Spirit, I'll read a verse in just a couple minutes that talks about rivers of living water will flow from your bellies. May you not try to contain it. Would you allow the Lord to use you? Every conversation you're in, could it switch? Are you looking for that spiritual twist in the middle of it? Lord, how can I share my faith with this person? Lord, how could you use me? I don't want to see them die and go to hell because guess what? There's another lake called the lake of fire that we don't want to see anybody going to. That's not a lake that you want to go visiting on weekends, right? So Jesus comes onto the scene he intentionally goes out of his way. The disciples are like, why are you taking us through Samaritan? You know, like, we don't want to go there. But there's this woman there at the heat of the day, at the middle of the day, at 12 o'clock noon, so to speak. You usually go get water in the morning because it's hot in the desert or at the evening. But she wants to go there at the time that nobody else is there because she don't want to be talking to anybody because she's the talk of the town because she had five husbands and she wasn't living the right way and she was doing things wrong. But Jesus intentionally goes up there and speaks to her and he asks her for some water. 
The son of the living God, the king of the universe, is asking her for a drink. And she looks at him and she's like, you're Jewish. Why are you asking me for a drink? What's wrong with you? And he turns the story around and says, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for a drink. Because I've got living water from which you will never have to thirst again, right? Journey, if you're faithful to do that, if you're praying, I bet you you'll get some people in your life that were completely unexpected that'll answer just like her because when he switched that story around, she's like, tell me where I could get me some of that, right? Tell me where I could get it. People are longing for the living water of God's word. They want to know him and you have it within you. The spirit of the living God is within you. Would we be a people who can't contain it any longer? Would we be a people who share our faith in the spirit of John 7:37 it says on the last day of the feast the great day Jesus stood up and cried out if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink whoever believes in me as the scripture said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water journey we have the work to do of digging to keep that well open to keep that well flowing in our life you're not meant to be stagnant you're meant to give it away so that others can get it and the kingdom of God can be advanced and more people can come to know Jesus would that be part of the story of the people of journey church that we love people enough to go out of the way to see them come to know our Lord our Savior and our King You know, when I started with that story of Ruby Falls, I never finished by telling you the story of that first shaft. The place that he originally thought was going to be the gold mine for his tourist attraction. Think about the miracle of that in and of itself, though. If he would have dug a couple feet to the right, a couple feet to the left, he would have never found that other shaft. You know, that first well, they ended up going and actually digging all the way down to it they ended up pouring cement and closing it back up. It didn't end up being nothing. It ended up being a cesspool that was dangerous to tourists because the water that was in there just got old and stagnant and nasty and they literally had to seal it up with cement. It's of no use to anybody. And isn't sin like that? It's so attractive. It draws us there. We go out of our way to go get the things of the world, and then all of a sudden they leave us nothing but lacking, no good for anything, a cesspool that will lead us to nowhere but destruction, right? When God has another way, another path. We're like Leo Lambert. You might need to get down on your knees, and you might need to tunnel just a little bit. But if you do, I assure you, if you seek him, you will find them. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Lord, we thank you and we praise you.